Okay, so we've got our book here. Uh, we're in lesson two, and uh, I have different pages because this is the teacher edition. For me, it's page 27, but for you, it's, uh, I don't know what page it is, but it's lesson two, uh, the, from Pentecost to, uh, to Patmos. So what we're looking at today is, uh, is New Testament history, New Testament history from the birth of the church, really at the day of Pentecost, um, all the way through to the New Testament, you know, our goal is to get through the New Testament and see how it develops historically. Um, and I, as you guys passed out, in case anybody needs one of these, um, I have this sheet here that uh, is two things. One of them is a timeline of church history that's in order. So it's an order of events of things that happened with this arrow on it that talks through and gives you uh, years in, you know, A.D. That's what those years are of the time and some different events that were happening at the time, but also when, like, Paul's missionary journeys were. And so that way you can understand, uh, understand them in order, understand the kind of story that's building. And on the back, something I think is equally uh, valuable is the order of the New Testament books when they were written. There is some debate, you know, and there can be some uh, believing differences of opinion on this, but this is also helpful to understand uh, as you read through the New Testament how doctrine was developing, being defended as different issues came up, different things that, uh, that were being said in the church. And I think it's also important to know what was... Uh, you know, the controversies that were handled, but also what was non-controversial, meaning things like there were controversies in the early church about salvation by grace through faith. There were controversies about whether Jesus really, you know, had a body in the flesh, but there weren't controversies about things like that the Old Testament name of Yahweh is applied to Jesus, that he is, you know, he is often uh, in scriptures where that talk about him very early on uh, by Jewish monotheists that refer to him as Lord while even quoting the Old Testament where it's talking about the God of the Old Testament. So there are things like that that, uh, that help us know that you know, there are things that weren't controversial in the early church, like James, the book of James, which is very early um, written that doesn't, doesn't really directly mention the resurrection. Uh, but presupposes that Jesus is the resurrected Lord, James, that, that half-brother of Jesus, that, you know, son of Mary and Joseph, is writing about these things, and he calls Jesus in uh, James 2, 1, our glorious Lord, or the Lord of glory, Jesus Christ, or he calls Jesus Lord along with, uh, along with God the Father. And so, but he just mentions these things, and he doesn't... Um, he doesn't feel the need to defend them. So it's helpful to know those things and know, okay, James is early. James is Jewish. He even talks about uh, Jewish monotheism. If you believe God is one, you do well, but that's not enough for saving faith is his kind of point there. And so it's sometimes helpful to see these Old Testament books in order and understand them in our historical context, which our pastor has done. We've gone through uh, over the years, Philippians and other books, and of course we've gone through uh, part of Acts, and maybe someday we'll go through Acts again, we'll see. Um, <laughs> Mr. Moore's not preaching this morning, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bill is, Uncle Bill is preaching this morning. I will be in morning. heaven by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Maybe we uh, all will be. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Yeah, yeah, the Lord could return. We'll, yeah, yeah, we never know. Okay, so um, our theme verse for this morning, if you want to turn to the book of Acts, we'll start kind of where church history starts, and I, I was telling, joking around with uh, Danny, I'm like, um, I've got my kind of four things this morning. I've got my Bible, my notes of things I want to talk about, I've got my sheet, you know, timeline of church history, and then I've got the book with the, the questions, so it's like, okay, I've got to, but, uh, you know, Spurgeon said, like, you know, the preachers have to think of eight things at once, and Spurgeon could do that, but, uh, but anyway, let's see if I can do four. Um, <laughs> But uh, that's why, you know, that's why we begin with prayer. You really do need to, you know, ask the Lord's help. Uh, but let's read the, the kind of theme verse. So Acts is a uh, key foundational book in salvation history that shows a transitionary time. 
And, uh, and Acts 1.8, familiar verse, but kind of gives us an outline. We'll actually start in 1.7, where Jesus is being asked, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring your kingdom? Jesus has been teaching to them about the kingdom of God. It made total sense they'd be asking about the kingdom. He said, okay, is this it? And Jesus has to kind of define for them, no, this is what your role is. And so in Acts 1.7 says, it is not for you to know the times and epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth, and even to the ends of the earth, as some of uh, translations will say. So Acts 1.8 kind of sets up an agenda and also kind of an outline of the book of Acts, that the point of the book of Acts is going to be the the spreading of the gospel and God's foundational laying of the church and setting up the church for the trajectory that it's going to have in salvation history. Now, they're, they're asking about the kingdom. Is the kingdom now going to be restored to Israel? Is this Jesus has risen from the dead? He's the, you know, proven to be the Messiah, proven to be the divine son of God. All this stuff is true. And now they're thinking, okay, all the truths in like Zechariah, Isaiah, all this stuff... Jesus is here, the king is here, we can move forward with the the kingdom agenda, and that's kind of true. Um, Jesus did not die in defeat, and he rose from the dead victoriously, and he reigns now, but Jesus kind of sets up what their uh, agenda is really going to be. No, your goal is not to be a theocratic kingdom in the sense of a political kingdom like Israel was. Your function is a witness function. The function of the church is a witness function that is going to have the aspects of the kingdom where we do have the aspects of a theocratic kingdom where we, God is our king, Christ is Lord, we follow his laws, we, we manifest some of those things in advance showing that that kingdom is going to happen on earth. But our job is not to do those, uh, to accomplish those things. Our th- job is to be witnesses. And this is set up very early in the beginning of the church, which is Acts is setting that course, setting that agenda for the church. <clears throat> and then there's kind of that outline of where, where the gospel will go. And we see this transitionary period in Acts of that it's going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. So the gospel is going to continue to expand. The church is going to expand. And why Acts is so crucial. I actually used to be uh, kind of disappointed with Acts because I used to think of it as like, well, we see Peter, we see Paul, we see you know a lot of these great things happening with them. How come we don't have as much history about the other apostles, what they're doing, what's going on with them? Uh, how come it's so much focused on Peter and Paul? Well, because what we're seeing here is as the Lord continues his ministry from heaven and builds his church, we're seeing this time where the gospel is going to, uh, and the church is going to move from beginning with its Old Testament background as a Jewish movement to being primarily a Gentile movement, which is, takes a long time. Uh, It takes a lot of getting used to. What we're used to today is the church is almost primarily Gentile. Like, we are almost totally Gentile. I think everyone in this room is a Gentile, as far as as I know. But that's kind of what we're uh, we're used to and what we uh, think of. But that's not always the paradigm that the church was in. In fact, it it was clear that Gentiles would become saved... But did they have to become Jewish to be saved? And that's one of the transitions within the book of Acts. And then as the gospel continues to come to uh, the Gentiles, it's going to become not exclusively Gentile, but it's going to become primarily uh, non-Jewish. And so Acts has to kind of explain that, as, as I said, as the Lord continues his ministry from heaven. So it's the sequel uh, to the book of Luke. So let's get some answers here in a little... Workbook, <clears throat> okay, Acts is written by, first fill in the blank there, is Acts is written by Luke. Okay, I don't think that's uh, probably new information to anyone, but, uh, but Luke being the historian that, who, 
who, uh, and the doctor who follows Paul and, ha- and shares in his, uh, in his ministry, writes uh, the book of Luke, and then the sequel, the book of Acts. And his goal is to write a history first of Jesus in consecutive order uh, to this person, Theophilus, who had heard about the gospel and Luke saying, okay, you know, here's, here's really kind of the whole thing so you can understand it. And if you look at kind of the, uh, the order of um, New Testament books, I am, you know I'm making you look at a lot of things, but uh, it's just helpful to understand kind of the order Luke, you understand, is traveling with Paul, being discipled by Paul, you know, ministering with Paul, and writing a lot of things down. And as Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles and sharing the gospel and doing all these things and, and kind of explaining his theology from the Old Testament and how that pertains to Christ, Paul, you know, writes these theological books and writes most of the uh, most of the content of the New Testament, Luke's actually writing a lot of it down as Paul's probably uh, speaking to him and he's writing it. But Paul's writing these books like Romans, First uh, and Second Corinthians, these books of massive theology. And then Luke comes about later under the direction of the Holy Spirit and writes a gospel that explains the history of the Jesus that Paul is preaching. And Luke goes to eyewitnesses and talks to them and and says, you know, this is the background. Can it, can it, the gospel that Paul is preaching, can it really be that way? And Luke says, yes. If you look at Jesus and his, uh, and what God is doing, what God is accomplishing in Jesus, you see that God is bringing about the fulfillment of all these things spoken of by Paul. So it's kind of helpful to understand that that's why Luke and Paul have some similar. Uh, similar language and things like that that go together. For example, Paul talks about Christ being <clears throat> being the firstborn, being the, meaning being the preeminent one, not the first in time, uh, but the unique one through whom God accomplishes all his purposes. And uh, Luke talks about when Jesus is born in Luke 2, that kind of Christmas narrative that Jesus is that Mary had her firstborn son and laid him in the manger, you know, something like that. So now that term had a larger kind of theological meaning, and it's helpful to understand, you know, that these things are going together in history of kind of how the, how these things are building. But Luke writes Acts uh, to talk about uh, the continual growth of the church as a sequel and the, the transition of time um, that takes place. So Acts covers, there's some other blanks here. Acts covers about 30 years. So Luke covers about 30 years, 30 years of Jesus' life, and then Acts covers about another 30 years, the 30 years of the beginning of the church and how the church was shaped by Christ over time and how things were moved in a particular direction. And so this takes place um, between AD 30 and AD 62, so about 30 to 32 years there. So, and that AD 30 to 62 is another blank there of, of, uh, that you have. And so, Acts is developing these themes over time. Um, and Acts is kind of, if we just read it, you would be like, okay, w- wow, that took place over 30 years? Like that, but it's kind of hard to see those things in some things. Like, for example, the first... Uh, several chapters of the book of Acts happen within the first two years. And then the rest is the remaining like 28 years. So it, it, Luke picks up the narrative a lot faster and moves a, through a lot more time as things pick up after really Acts uh, 9 and, and things like that, after the conversion of Saul. Um, so Acts is going through that, uh, that transitionary period. We'll look at Acts 2 in just a minute. But I wanted to just identify um, some things how we, you know, how we get these time periods. Um, Luke 3.23 is where Jesus is identified at the beginning of his ministry of being about 30 years old. So that's kind of where we know uh, these things and how we kind of put a time marker on it. Jesus was probably born in about 4 AD, which I, uh, 4 BC, sorry, which... I know it sounds weird because we think BC is before Christ, AD is after, you know, that type of thing. Uh, 
Um, but the, the calendar was kind of adjusted later. But Jesus was probably born around 4 BC and dies and rises from the dead around 30 AD. Um, and we can identify that Luke uh, points out the age of Jesus about 30 in Luke 3.23 when he begins uh, his ministry. But let's just talk about what it meant to be, become a Christian in the first century, what the, the cost was and what the challenges were of becoming a Christian in general in the first century. There are a lot of struggles that we'll talk about, but one of them was that Christianity was new. And to us, you know, I was uh, writing a uh, paper and my, from, you know, a master's class, and this uh, professor warned me about a source. He said, you want to be careful about a source that's from 2004. And I'm like, okay, you know, which is true in like academic research, you want to be uh, current and that type of stuff that sometimes things are valuable from the, from the past and that doesn't change, but also, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're current on your research and that type of thing. But 2004 wasn't that long ago. And so today we're our kind of uh, presuppositions are the opposite, is that we value things that are kind of new, updated, like, you know, the new iPhone or things like that, that change things, but, uh, yeah, you guys a little room there? But in the ancient world, in the Roman world, there was an appreciation of things that were old, and a suspicion of things that were new, things that were new were not seen as having, uh, of having value. So Christianity, which was seen as this offshoot of Judaism, it was like, well, why would we take it seriously? It's, it's a new faith. It's, it's just happened. Jesus died just a few years ago. What, why would we accept this as a valid uh, worldview? And so it had a challenge. So one of the things that Christianity had to demonstrate uh, and did demonstrate was that it, even though it was a new event in salvation history and God's plan for the world is that actually it had very ancient origins. It had to, it goes all the way back. Judaism was actually had, had some uh, respect in the Roman world because it claimed that it was ancient in origin. It went all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to God's creation of the world. And so Christianity says, actually, we're the culmination of everything that the Old Testament looked toward. That while this is a, a new event, God has accomplished something new. It's something that was brought about over time. And that's why you see in the Gospels such a, uh, and in the New Testament in general, such a tie to the Old Testament. For example, when Paul writes, uh, it's into Romans 1, 2, when Paul writes his Gospel, not his Gospel, he writes his letter to the Romans, uh, to establish them in the truth, to kind of give them a, a primer of the gospel and prepare them for what the gospel is. He's writing to them in the you know, center of the Roman world in Rome. And one of the things that he explains in Romans 1-2 is he's talking about the gospel of God in Romans 1-1. He says, but he's, listen to what he says about it. in Romans 1-2. He says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. So the Romans is about establishing the Romans and the truth, but also showing the gospel and history and tying it all together that Christianity is actually ancient in its origins while it is a new expression of God's uh, redempt redemptive plan. And so Christianity is, is new in that sense, but it's also very old. It has a claim to those things. But that was one of the challenges in uh, the ancient world. And, and let me read some sources here. Um, outside the Bible. It's Jesus referred to outside the Bible. Now, the Bible is actually, even if someone was not a Christian, it is amazing as a historical source because you don't usually have that much historical written data and material going back that far in the past. It's fragments, or sometimes there are things that we know somebody wrote a book, but we have it only in fragments and quotes. So for example, like a philosophy, like Epicureanism or something that we can read about, we know existed, we know some people kind of generally what they believe. We don't have any of their original sources. We don't have any of their 
uh, books. We don't have any of their teachings or really can't say definitively exactly what their quotes were because they're quoted in other people who may be in agreement with them or may not be. And so there are a lot of, there's a lot of data that's missing. And so there's a lot of limits to history. For example, Julius Caesar, the documents explaining his, his existence, we know Julius Caesar existed, he conquered and he had a bunch of um, success as a, a military dictator, all these things in, as a Roman Caesar. But there's only like nine partial manuscripts referring to the existence of Julius Caesar. And, uh, and they are manuscripts that are copies of copies hundreds of years after the fact. But historically, that's pretty good because a, a copies of copies a hundred year, couple hundred years later shows, okay, there are copies of something earlier and then going back, we can kind of piece together, but it's kind of difficult to do that history. The New Testament has tens of thousands of copies of manuscripts uh, that are very detailed in terms of we know uh, so much about Jesus. So it's not like when I'm showing you these sources of Jesus outside the New Testament uh, that, okay, well, we can now prove that Jesus did in fact exist. It's like, no, the, the New Testament itself is the historical data um, that doesn't have anything in, uh, in comparison. Um, and by the way, Jesus, these things were written within a lifetime, not enough time for myth to develop and they're spreading across the known world at that time. Not enough time for anybody to try to change or control anything, you know, like it talks about in the Da Vinci Code, or sometimes Mormons will say, well, yeah, Christians got together and changed all that stuff. Christians were a persecuted religion that didn't have the power to do that, and they were an evangelistic religion that was writing all these things down and writing it in different languages and spreading it everywhere, within a few generations of Jesus' lifetime. Which means that if somebody was going to control it, they'd have to track down all of that stuff and change all of it without anybody noticing over a course of a couple hundred years. Which would be impossible. There's no central uh, controlling agent oh, that can uh, control those things, make those changes. So when people say, well, Christianity was, was mythologized, wasn't enough time. When Christianity was, was changed from what it originally said, spread too quickly. There wasn't enough time to do that. There wasn't the ability to do that. So what we have is the historical beliefs in the New Testament of what people actually believed during that time. But there are additional sources that talk about Jesus. And I'll read you uh, Josephus's Antiquity of, Antiquities of the Jews here. And he writes that uh, Josephus is a historian um, around the time um, of the New Testament. He's living that time. He's born after the time of Jesus. But he is writing, and he writes about, you know, he's a pretty valuable uh, source, but there's, there's limits. We don't have that much. But uh, he does write about Jesus. Now, there's some question with this quote as to whether or not, like, okay, did somebody tamper with it? And there may be some good reason to believe that. But I'll talk about why it's still significant even if that's true. Um, so Josephus in his book, he says, Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men, uh, as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many Gentiles. He was the Christ, or the Messiah. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day. And the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named him are not ex extinct at this day. Now, there are some historians who look at that quote and they say, and they have some good reason to believe Josephus was not a Christian. And Josephus was a Jew who did not really believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But they believe, they, can, they believe that they can identify, okay, if we cross out where it says he was the Christ, or they think it's still identifying this man, Jesus, as a historical person within the first century at the time Christianity is being taught. And 
that the, it identifies some important things, for example, that Jesus is doing wonderful works, of uh, the claim to the resurrection. Okay, so these are very early Christian claims. Tacitus, a Roman historian, and not a very sympathetic one to the, the Christians, uh, speaks about that later on in history, uh, Nero, who is trying to uh, build something, uh, there's a fire that happens, and Tacitus kind of has a suspicion that Nero is the one who started this fire, but Nero blames it on the Christians. Says, okay, the Christians started this fire, and then that's where really an intense persecution starts for the Christians. But uh, Tacitus kind of explains in that context and refers to who the Christians are in the first century. It says, consequently, to get rid of the report of the fire, Nero like, is trying to get the, the pressure off him of being blamed about the fire, which we don't really know how it started. Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, or Christ, from who the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty, crucifixion, during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators. That's exactly what Luke says. So Jesus lived at the, at the time of Tiberius and was crucified by one of our procurators, Pontius Pilate, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out, not only in Judea, the first source of its evil, so that's important. So the, he calls Christianity a superstition, but it's important that it comes from Judea. It doesn't come from an outside source that started to change the, uh, the message. So a, an unsympathetic Roman historian is noticing this as well. And so he says, but uh, from its first source, but even in Rome, where all things hideous, shameful, from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was made of all who pleaded guilty to being a Christian. Then upon their information, an immense multitude were convicted, not so much for the crime of firing the city, but for hatred against mankind. So they basically said that Christians are, are hateful against mankind because they are antisocial, they're outside of society, because they deny the Roman gods. So they could have Jesus as a God. They didn't want Jesus to be God, the only way, um, and to deny the other gods, of ancestral gods, and the God of Rome, that, and the genius of Caesar that you would swear allegiance to in some way. So it says, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths, covered with skins of beasts. They were torn by dogs and perished, or nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt uh, to serve as nightly illumination, uh, when the daylight expired. So you hear a lot of what these Christians are going through um, within the first century, so that they, they're just by simply not acknowledging Caesar as Lord, not acknowledging the gods of Rome as kind of the, the kind of political gods, that you could have whatever gods you wanted in the Roman world, but the Christians were viewed as atheists because they only acknowledged one god. Uh, and it's important to recognize that uh, we today, because of the influence of Christianity, we today identify, if we had like a survey and you checked off your ethnicity and then you checked off your religion, we see those as separate categories. Back in this time, they were not separate categories. It was seen that your ethnicity, your national identity, your family heritage was tied to certain gods. And therefore, you could add on and have whatever gods you wanted, but you needed to be loyal to your family heritage, your ethnicity, your ethnic and ancestral gods, and especially recognize the god of Roma, the god of the, uh, of the nation, of the empire. And then you would swear by the genius of Caesar, and you'd throw incense saying, you know, on an altar saying, Caesar is Lord. Christians didn't do that. They didn't acknowledge that. Now, the Jews were seen, they had kind of a place that was developed uh, where they could continue to be monotheistic. They only believed in their one God as the one true God, um, which is true. But the Romans came to respect that a little bit. But that was because they thought that annoying, like, unreasonable belief in one God 
from those stubborn Jews, they thought, okay, well, that's just because that's the God of their ethnic identity. But when Christians started coming about and you started having Jew and Gentile believing in Jesus, abandoning their ancestral gods, as it talks about in 1 Thessalonians 1.9, that you turn from idols to serve the living and true God, this was seen as an abandoning of everything. This was seen as an abandoning of your family heritage, of the loyalty to your family, of, of stepping outside of society, of being politically antisocial. This is seen as, as a betrayal, and, so, and it's seen as atheism a denial of all gods except one. And so they're seen as traitors, and they're accused of being immoral. And as they meet in secret, they're accused of all sorts of um, immoral activities that are going on. So there's a a heavy cost uh, to being a Christian. Now today, we think, okay, you identify your religion separate from, um, from your ethnicity for the most part, especially in the West. And uh, that's because of Christianity. Christianity was the one that that broke that paradigm and actually changed uh, world history to think a different way about how to uh, consider those things. But that's just some information about how how Christianity was perceived in the first century. So it was a great sacrifice to to become a Christian. So let me just read a quote on this. This book is called... uh, quote from this book is called Destroyer of the Gods. It's a study of the, it's a historical study of the first century that'll explain some of this. And it says, there was not anything like the repeated increasing hostile stance taken by the Roman authorities against the early Christians. Moreover, whatever the particular offenses that prompted the actions against the various foreign cults in Rome, meaning there were persecution of other groups, not just Christians, but the Christians drew a special attention. And here's why. Um, None of them constituted a threat to the worship of traditional deities. Meaning you could have any religion you wanted, and any religion could commit certain offenses and get punished for that, or have some political pressure put on them for that. But Christianity alone was the threat to the worship of traditional deities and was seen as a threat to the government because the government was bound up in Caesar being a god. And so if you denied that, you were seen as uh, denying the, the power and final authority of the Roman government, which was true. The Christians uh, said that then, and we say that now, that the, the ultimate authority that we follow is Christ. Uh, it doesn't mean that we are revolutionaries. It means that we have a prior commitment to the lordship of Jesus Christ. We say Jesus is Lord, not Caesar, and, or any other political state. But the Christians were a threat to the worship of uh, these gods. And, and we're seeing that again today. It's like people, uh, whether they acknowledge it or not, we think we're, you know, we're kind of like an enlightenment, you know, post-enlightenment modern society, but where people think that uh, their political ideologies or their other things that, that they may hold, their worldviews, those are their religions. And they have gods and they want others to worship them. Um, and if you don't believe that, watch the election. The people are very upset about which God's going to win. You know, it's, a, it's an ancient uh, competition between one God uh, beats the other in battle and then you get to have your way, right? And so that's kind of what, you know, people, if you get down to the base uh, kind of assumptions, they treat it the same way. Uh, but anyway, it goes on here. New cults were typically seen as additions to the cafeteria of deities, so like a hometown buffet type of thing, and religious groups of the Roman world. Not even the Jews were such a threat, for although the, uh, the Jewish texts of that time expressed disdain for the pagan gods, there is no indication that the Roman era Jews actually attempted seriously to persuade the non-Jewish population to abandon their deities that Jews themselves typically abstained from worshiping the gods was viewed by pagans as an ethnic peculiarity. Meaning, okay, the Jews are just weird. They just, because they're Jews, they worship one God. But when Christians came about and started challenging the other deities, saying, no, there's only one true God, the creator, and that he's been revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, and that we're all accountable to, I mean, that's, That's a bold statement. It's a bold statement today. It always has been. It says, but early Christians, because it was programmatically trans-ethnic in its appeal, 
and more aggressive in attacking what it called idolatry was a new and more serious danger. So Christianity was a threat to the Roman world, but and and Roman the Roman world was a threat in a sense to Christianity. There was, you hear these uh, these terrible persecutions and things going on, but Rome's gone. Where's Rome today? You know, it's Christianity still around for two thousand years, and Christianity went through brutal persecution uh, throughout those two thousand years in different parts of the world, and especially early on. But the kingdom of Rome is gone. You know, at least in that manifestation, uh, that it's it's not a transcendent world power anymore, right? It's nations and kingdoms rise and fall. Christ continues to build his church. Christ continues to uh, move forward in his, his redemptive plan and agenda for history. And so, it's just some information to think through a little bit as we kind of consider, okay, well, what did it mean to be a Christian? You know, what was the cost of being a Christian? But let's look uh, a little further at Acts. Okay, so Acts um, Kind of one through seven, Jesus is preached in Jerusalem and Judea, and we see that you know developing that Jesus' uh, message is going kind of through the the Jewish world. But then in Acts eight, uh, it kind of goes to Samaria, and you see there again the sign of tongues, as, as we'll talk about in Acts two in just a second. Um, now the gospel is being uh, enfranchised to the Samaritans and who have kind of similar roots with Judaism, but a lot of conflict. And if you want to talk about systemic differences, I mean, Jews and Samaritans had hundreds of years of that stuff. Uh, But now we're coming together in the church and identifying each other on the same, uh, same footing. But that thinking, that paradigm shift took time to happen. And then uh, Acts 9, conversion of Saul, Right? And we'll talk about that in Acts 10, Peter going to the Gentile world. But there's some blanks there that talks about the, the radical transformation of the disciples uh, of two history-defining events. Okay? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus rose from the dead. And that's important because we don't just hold Jesus in a memory as a philosopher or good teacher. We're talking about the resurrected Lord and Savior. And that's what sets Christianity apart from uh, what might be called Christian liberalism. That's like, well, we just remember Jesus as like a good guy and he taught us to be kind and stuff. We're saying, no, Jesus died and got up by the power of God. And that resurrection shows that he's coming back to judge the whole earth, that the whole earth is accountable to him, and that everybody. Uh, needs to repent. That's what Paul talks about in Acts 17. So that's what Christianity is. If you, if you don't want to believe the resurrection and you just want to believe Jesus was a nice guy, nice teaching, okay, fine, but that's not Christianity. And so the resurrection of Jesus, central aspect of Christianity, and then the coming of the Holy Spirit, coming of the Holy Spirit as eyewitnesses to the resurrected Christ, the apostles boldly testified to the truth about him, doing so through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus says, You'll, as we read in Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So, and it's not power just in the sense of, um, okay, to accomplish the work. It is that. But you see the Holy Spirit empowered all kinds of people through the Old Testament. And the Holy Spirit anointed kings and things of that nature and empowered them to do a certain work. But the Holy Spirit is now filling uh, people and has that that sense of nearness that now uh, because of the work of Christ that the Holy Spirit has come in a new and permanent way to indwell believers um, for the power and the mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Okay, so a few more blanks there. It's because the disciples had been sent by Jesus as his witnesses. They are known as apostles, meaning sent ones or ambassadors sent ones or ambassadors and they're unique uh, ambassadors for Christ we're all supposed to be ambassadors for Christ uh, but the apostles are ones who are unique in the laying of the foundation of the church they had to see the resurrected Lord which a lot of people did but they also had to be commissioned uh, 
by the Lord to be a, uh, an apostle, meaning they were laying the doctrinal foundation of the church, having been direct disciples of Jesus Christ, to, it, to give his message and his teachings to, uh, for the church going forward. And so, you know, you, do we want to kind of know what else Jesus taught? Well, yeah. Well, it's, it, the rest of the New Testament kind of bears that out, as the apostles are teaching. But let me read um, Ephesians 2.20, which is a key verse here to understand the kind of role of the apostles and kind of that foundational role they had toward the beginning of the church. Ephesians 2.20, familiar scripture to many of us. Uh, so it's talking about 19, that we're all one uh, in God's household, we're being built up as a temple in the Lord, all that. And it says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom, being build, uh, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple of the Lord. Um, and that paradigm, I think, is a lot easier to understand if you uh, heard the uh, class we did previously on Zechariah, that the Messiah, Jesus, is the temple. He is the temple theology, and then he's the foundation stone of the temple, which is like what it talks about in Psalm 118, that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, that Jesus is the foundation stone of the temple. It's all founded on him, not just on what he said, but what Jesus actually accomplished in history. And so Jesus is the foundation, and then the apostles uh, have this role of laying the, the doctrinal foundation of the church, of teaching what Jesus taught, of, of establishing for example, the New Testament for all time to be the found doctrinal foundation of the church, going back to Jesus as the cornerstone. So, there aren't apostles today. You're not an apostle. I'm not an apostle, except in the sense that, the sense that we can be ambassadors. We can be sent ones. There are other uses of that term, but we're not that type of uh, of apostles. Um, so. As we continue kind of here through Acts and kind of the history of Acts, so we see in Acts 2 the birth of the church, the beginning of the church where there's uh, the miraculous signs where they are speaking in tongues, um, and there's the coming of the Holy Spirit like a great wind. There's a lot going on here that uh, Luke, as the author of Acts, is putting together for us to kind of pick up on, that Pentecost is that that feast of first fruits, which is you know tied in with the idea of the Holy Spirit is is showing that the you know His indwelling of us is a first fruits that God is going to complete the rest of His uh, work in salvation history. But there's also the sound of the great wind, and this you know that ties to the idea of the Holy Spirit coming in uh, Ezekiel, but also the wind of the Holy Spirit uh, in creation, creating. A new man, creating uh, the kind of new man in Christ here. And Peter preaches, and several people get saved through Peter's preaching, calling them to Christ. And so we see here the birth of the church, and we also see the miracle of speaking in tongues, that this was a sign of the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, a sign for the Jews to recognize that they heard in places like in Isaiah, when you hear these foreign tongues, you know, it's a, it's a recognition that God said, I'm going to speak to you. You're not going to listen in the language I speak to you in, okay? Then we will speak to you in foreign tongues, and that would pertain to their exile. So when they're hearing these things, and they're hearing all these languages, they're recognizing, okay, there's a sign here from God, and uh, God wants us to do something. And that's even what they ask Peter in Acts 2. What does God want us to do? You know, what do these things mean? What's, the, what's our proper response to these things? And we also see that sign of tongues as a kind of reversal of the Tower of Babel, where it's, you know, the languages were confused. Now God is bringing together um, the languages in one, uh, in one new man in Christ. And so there's those themes there that reverse... Uh, what's going on, but let's answer some, some other questions here about kind of the right before Pentecost. Uh, 
to authenticate their message, God also gave the apostles the ability to perform miracles. So these are authenticating signs of the apostles and a few others that are connected with the apostles. These are supernatural signs demonstrated uh, that they were God's messengers and their testimony that Jesus Christ was true. Okay, so these are key um, elements of the early church to establish the, the evidence that the church is in fact what it claims to be. That it is in fact uh, the working off the power of God. And so it's not that they, you know, n- not today where it's like, okay, you've got Benny Hinn trying to heal people or, you know, slapping people down in the spirit and it heals them or people healing their lower back pain. These are miraculous signs that are supernatural in origin. They're immediate. They're, it's not just like, okay, you pray for someone to be healed and hope God heals them. These were actual uh, authenticating miracles and they're not done today. Um, God can do whatever he wants. We don't limit God in the extent of his power, but uh, these are miracles that that we're not authorized to perform. The doctrinal foundation of the church has already been laid. um, So while God can do whatever he wants, there's not an expectation that we would continue with these things. So the, uh, the apostolic period comprises a foundational era in church history. I already read Ephesians 2.20. Where John, the last uh, when John, the last surviving apostle, died around year 100, the apostolic age came to a close. So now the church has to move forward over that hundred years. If we just think about that, without the apostles, without Jesus being on earth. Now the apostles have written, but you know that's a that's a big shift in redemptive history. You you from having Jesus himself on the earth to Jesus having died, resurrected, and returned to heaven, then the apostles, the actual men who were discipled by Jesus, they're you know, laying the doctrinal foundation of the church. And then at the end of this era, there are no more apostles. And so the church is kind of moving into a, you know, a new stage, a new world at this point. So this is a... a That's just to say, this is a unique time in salvation history. Um, And then the church is born, we've been talking about in Acts 2, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised that he would build his church. The promise began to be fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, right, in the year A.D. 30. Okay, and then Acts 2 records what happened on that dramatic day. So there's... A lot going on in Acts 2. Uh, Originally, how many uh, disciples were there? Well, well, yeah, yeah, that's true. Let me be a little more uh, specific. The 12, yes, disciples. Then uh, in Acts 1, how many disciples are there, like, praying and waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit? Does anybody remember? 11. There were 11 minus Jews, but there, there are more. Decide- 70, a little bit more. It's in Acts. I don't remember off the top of my head either. Where it's, uh, yeah, it's 120, which is a blank there. So the church has started out. Just, but that is just to say, not to you know, like to guess what I'm thinking. I have the answer here. I don't remember where that was said. But anyway, um, Yes, so there were 12 original. Judas uh, fell away, obviously, and then they replaced him to have kind of that original 12, and then there's Paul as well. Um, But then, yes, there's the original kind of 120 followers, including Mary, the mother of the Lord, and and all these people that are there together praying, waiting for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then let me read um, Acts 2, 1 through 4. Here it says, when the day of Pentecost had come, this Jewish feast that takes place after uh, the Passover, that's the feast of the first fruits, okay, so that's important to recognize, God is choosing this time on purpose. They were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like violent rushing wind. Okay, the wind is, in the Old Testament, is the actions usually of, uh, or often of the Holy Spirit. And so, and it filled the house, and all were sitting there, and there appeared to them tongues 
as of fire, distributing themselves on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. And these are other languages. They're not just a uh, babbling like prayer speech. These are... It's identified later that people are hearing languages and specific dialects, meaning, you know, they're not only hearing, for example, English, there's the English that we're speaking right now, but there's also the English of like Scotland or like Australia, you know, it's a dialect, right? Or like Spanish from Mexico or Spanish from Spain, very different type of thing. So when the, when these people are speaking in tongues, it's this sign toward the Jews in uh, Acts 2.12, and, uh, and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. This is when the people have come to hear this sound of this rushing wind, and uh, saying to one another, what does this mean? You know, what does God want us to do? And then, you know, others are mocking, they're full of sweet wine. And uh, Peter says, no, we're not drunk, it's only nine in the morning, wouldn't have had, wouldn't have had enough time. And so he, and he starts his sermon, and he talks about Jesus, you know, who, uh, who they know about Jesus. They probably, you know, know that Jesus has, you know, died. They, you know, don't maybe know the claims necessarily yet of the, the resurrection. And Peter says, no, here's what God wants you to do. Remember Joel in the Old Testament. He talks about this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel where Joel talks about that there would be the, in the last days, there would be the coming of the Holy Spirit in kind of a fullness. And Peter says, this is that. This is a sample of showing that that is going to take place. And he says that, uh, that people would dream dreams, that they do prophecy, all that type of stuff. And he says, this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel, and then brings it to a conclusion in Joel 2, where he says that, and all who can't call on the name of the Lord, all who call on the name of Yahweh will be saved. So Joel in that time was preaching for Israel to repent. Now Peter goes and transitions, listen to verse uh, Acts 2.22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. This man was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, total sovereignty of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, human responsibility. But God raised him up again, having put an end to the agony of death, reversed the course of life, death. Now there's death, life, because of Christ, since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. And he says, for David says of him, then quotes Psalm 16, where David is talking about the not allow, God not allowing his Holy One to undergo decay, and that God's goodness to David in the Davidic covenant means that ultimately God would have to overcome death through the Messiah. And that's what Peter says. He, so he says, David's tomb, this wasn't spoken of David. You can look over and see David's tomb not too far away. David's dead and buried, and he's been dead and buried, but Jesus rose from the dead. This Jesus rose from the dead, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so he said that because it was impossible for uh, it to be held by, uh, Jesus to be held by death's power. And so it says this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses, therefore having been, not only is he raised, but therefore having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father, the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth, which you now see and hear. And that see and hear is really important because in Isaiah, uh, it was said against Israel, and this was generationally true of Israel, that seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, meaning they're stubborn, they're, they're unrepentant, they don't listen to God, they don't have a heart to respond to God. And so now he says, look, now you're seeing it, now you're hearing it. Are you going to continue the pattern that you've continued for so long in resisting God? Or are you going to turn to God? And then he quotes uh, Psalm 110, speaking of the Messiah, and applies it to Jesus. It says, For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself said, David writes this, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. 
Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, uh, if you ever have a quick apologetic side note here, if you ever have uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and say that Jesus isn't God and you want to talk to them, which you should, uh, they need the gospel or Mormons, you know, that type of thing. You could go to John 1.1, 1, 1, but they have a whole built-up thing where they, they won't listen to explaining John 1.1, 1, 1, okay? But notice Peter quoted Joel uh, 2.32 in Acts 2.21, where it says, Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh, the name of the Lord, will be saved. And now he talks about Jesus is that Lord. Whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain God has made him both Lord and Christ. So he's referring to Jesus in that same terminology as the God of the Old Testament. And so there's a response. People turn to the Lord. They're hearing these languages. They recognize these signs and the church is born. Um, and then about 3,000 people are saved at that time. And these are people who were saved and, and baptized. So it's not just kind of 3,000 in general. We actually get kind of a listing of these 3,000 people who were saved. But a few more blanks here. Okay, uh, so Pentecost was one of the major days celebrated by the Jewish people. For that reason, many Jewish pilgrims had traveled to Jerusalem from throughout the Roman Empire. These pilgrims lived in many parts of uh, the Roman Empire and therefore spoke native languages other than Aramaic or Greek. Aramaic or Greek. So those were kind of the trade languages. Those were kind of like English today. English is what's called a lingua franca, meaning it's a language that is a language that pretty much most people speak, even worldwide, even if they're not from English-speaking countries. Thankfully, because it's like, I don't know any other languages, but, uh, but you know, I picked a good one. No. Uh, but uh, Greek and Aramaic were kind of like that back then. They were the languages of the, of the nations, of the people that you would interact with. Um, Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew. Greek was that kind of Koine Greek that the Old Testament was written in the common language, the common tongue. Uh, moving on here, the... the that other blank, the miraculous gift of tongues, the Holy, uh, the miraculous gift is known as the gift of tongues. So it's talking about, okay, this is, they were amazed, you know, what was the sign? Well, it was because they spoke in tongues. The Holy Spirit used it on the day of Pentecost to draw a crowd, but also to demonstrate that the gospel of Jesus Christ extends to all nations. Now that's going to become important. Tongues is, shows up, not all the time, but strategic points in Acts. Shows up here, shows up with the Samaritans to show, okay, the Samaritans are receiving the same salvation. They're receiving the Holy Spirit in the same way. Then it shows up in even maybe more importantly in Acts 10, shows up when Peter goes and preaches the gospel to God-fearing but uncircumcised Gentiles. The Holy Spirit comes on them. They speak in tongues. And they're amazed, and Peter's like, well, God has saved them the same way he saved us. And he's like, I now know God is not one to show partiality. Then he goes and explains that back to the uh, Jewish brethren. They're like, wait, you baptized uncircumcised people? Is that, is that allowed? And he talks about, look, God gave them the same sign of tongues as he did with us in the beginning. Who was I to stand in God's way? You know, this is obviously what God is now uh, accomplishing and bringing in Gentiles on the same level as fellow citizens in uh, God's household, as it talks about in Ephesians. But that paradigm takes a long time to adjust. In fact, as time moves on, there's going to be this, this clash, this doctrinal clash about uh, people saying in Acts 15 and other places, unless you're circumcised, you cannot be saved. So that starts to become a problem. Uh, and they, the church has to settle that very early on. Uh, lastly, here is addressing some of the crowd. The miracle of Apostle Peter preached a powerful gospel sermon, which you just read some of. In response, some 3,000 people believed. They professed faith in Christ and were baptized as a symbolic demonstration of their repentance. And on this incredible day, the church was born. So, 
from there, we're going to quit here, close in prayer. We didn't get through everything, but it's like I kind of surprise myself every time. I'm like, oh man, I didn't get through all my material, but like I said, I've got a lot of things to, to look at here. And Brett even left. I'm like, no, just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, hopefully this helps us understand you know, the, the witness function that we have as a church and our mandate uh, to be faithful to that, um, and that we as Gentiles get to go out and, and worship uh, the Lord Jesus, worship God the Father through Christ uh, with that same Holy Spirit. So let's uh, close in a word of prayer and then go to worship together. Lord God, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can see you working through history. We thank you that we can see our Lord Jesus building his church, filling, fulfilling that promise. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit showing your intimacy with us, that you've made us a, a holy temple. And Lord, we pray that we would live in a way that is faithful and consistent with all of those realities as we go out to worship you uh, collectively with the body of Crown Valley this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.